I can go any time. You oh. can go first if you have good cases, whatever. I'll let you go first. Go. Sure. Okay. Okay, this is the first case. So this has a nice evolution of findings and I'll show you over time. And it goes from 2003 to now. So in looking at her medical records, which are actually turn out to be a bit confusing, she apparently was diagnosed a long time ago with systemic lupus, perhaps on the basis of at least in part pleuritis and pericarditis. And she's been treated with different anti-inflammatory medications over a period of years. And let me first just show you these initial images from 2003, which are just step and shoot, but I'll just give you a representative image of what her lung bases look like. So there are a couple of findings there, but nothing that really enables one to make a particular diagnosis. There's some cystic change there, partially imaged. And some ill-defined sentry lobular, or at least very small ground glass attenuating opacities in the lower lung zones. And I can't provide a label for that if I was, if I was reading that so much. So let me go forward now in time to one from 2017. So this is 2003 to Actually, let me just show you the bottom of the abdominal CT from 2013. So that is 10 years. And let me just try and prevent that from happening and bring this one up. So this is 2013. Now we have a lot more abnormality. And we have cystic spaces a lot in the lower lung zones. And of course, some of them are subpleural. But in addition to that, we also have ill-defined ground glass attenuating opacities in the lung bases as well. So now I'll leave that one up on the right-hand side and bring up one from 2017, which is about four years later. Let me just pick up the thin cut for you. Some expiration images. So here is 2017, and you can still see we have disease in the lower lung zones. We have a lot of cystic change that doesn't appear very different from before, but there's a lot more ground glass attenuating opacity in the lower lung zones as well in 2017. Now I'll bring up the most recent, which is the other day, and the findings are very similar. So extensive cystic lung disease, and but a lot of ground glass opacity in the lower lungs. And more recently, she was discovered, I guess someone decided to test for them. She has one antisynthetase antibody. And in a moment, I'll show you which one it is, but it's not an anti jo one And there is a clinical suspicion, but not verified for a myositis. So, do you agree with me when, if I said that, although there's a lot of cystic lung disease in the lower lung zones, the findings are not suggestive of the cystic lung disease, the honeycombing of say UIP or a fibrosing lung disorder necessarily, because there's no traction bronchiectasis in the lower lung zones. If you follow some of these bronchi out, they're not dilating. So I think this is a form of non-honeycombing, at least in terms of pathogenesis and implication, cystic lung disease. And we've certainly seen that before. I think Seth in particular shown something like this in, in SLE in particular, I think, Seth. And I think Jeff has mentioned- Yeah, sorry, it. I'm here. Yeah, no, I, I've seen it specifically in lupus a lot too. Um, yeah. I, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know what is going on there. Be nice to get PATH. And Does the this patient really have lupus or because of, is it just they had a positive ANA, but they also have positive, you know, myositis antibodies now? Yeah, I don't know if they've treated for this antibodies before, but she's, she carries a diagnosis of lupus. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean, patients with antisympathase syndrome can have just positive ANAs. But yeah, no, but, yeah, but back right. to the point, I yeah. mean. They have fibro right. she has fibrosis. And even if you call it honeycombing, the ground glass is outside the areas of fibrosis and it wouldn't be suggestive of a UIP pattern anyway. Yeah. 
and certainly we can see a cellular interstitial pneumonitis organizing pneumonia as a as a finding in antisynthesis syndrome. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, you, could, you could call it connective tissue disease associated ILD. I think that's what our pulmonologists are sort of calling it. If it, I mean, if you want to give it a label. You know, and I've seen yeah. cystic spaces in, in some scleroderma patients too, not to this extent, oh, yeah, but insane. it's clearly not honeycomb cysts in the sense of UIP, and it's clearly not dilated airways, or at least it not connects to an airway, but and I don't know what to do yeah. with it. Yeah, I, we just call it CTDILD. That seems to work pretty well. Yeah, right. That's okay. a nice example, a nice evolution of that. And it's, what's nice on your image here is, I mean, there's like, if you go up, there's no involvement, which is very typical of this. And is there anything anteriorly? And is that little thing? But not That's really. a really good point, too, because you know, UIP, IPF should involve the upper lobes. Right. And that's a point that you know, I think, in particular, Gruden likes to make. You know, even though it's more basal predominant, it, you should have involvement in the upper lobes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it has a positive predictive value for histologic UIP that there's upper lobe involvement. Not dominance, but, but involvement. Yeah. Cool. I think this is this is the zero corner sign here. Of <laughs> autoimmune ILD. All right. This one I had not seen before, so let me show you the chest radiograph, which is pretty confusing. Can certainly confuse me. So I did have information concerning aortic coarctation and multiple interventions for it. And as I looked at this, of course, I did recognize that it has a stent in the proximal descending aorta, so that's fine. And I saw findings consistent with previous chest surgery, fine. But of course, this for sure confused me. There's an opacity here, yet there is some air containing lung medial to it. Kind of looks tubular. And sure enough, the explanation for that, and I've not seen this before, is on this angio, where you can see it is indeed a tubular structure. So the tubular structure goes from ascending aorta to the left hemithorax to descending aorta. And of course, here it's not in the lung, but it's just surrounded by lung. So it's undoubtedly the extra pearl and the lung has just in a sense enveloped it here and there. And this is indeed a so-called ascending to descending aortic bypass, which is sometimes done. I don't know when it's done or why it's done in a particular patient, but that's certainly what this is and explains the chest radiographic findings. So here are some diagrams about where and what route the bypass may take, depending on the surgeon, I guess. So it's certainly my, my first case of an ascending to descending bypass for co-optation. And I don't know to what extent um, these other things or how these other stents played into it and how things evolved over time. But there it is. Anyone seen that before? I guess it's not commonly done. I think I've seen a, an aortic bypass, but I can't remember if it was for coarc or something else congenital, but yeah, an extra anatomic shot. I know, I showed one that was to the descending aorta. It was, I think it was like LV to like aorta near the diaphragmatic hiatus a few years ago, so. Yeah, we've, I've seen a couple of various aortic bypasses. They're always interesting. Okay. Good, my first one. This one is a, a nice case, so I think. So in looking at this person, he has carried the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease or restrictive lung disease for a long time. He's been worked up for pulmonary hypertension. But in a patient that has a diagnosis of restrictive lung disease and looking at this chest radiograph and looking for findings of an interstitial lung disorder, interstitial lung fibrosis. One doesn't see that. Now this goes back quite some time. So these are from 2016. This is a CT from the next month in 2016. 
and in looking at the lung parenchyma, it actually looks really good. So yeah, there are a few subsegmental opacities in the lung bases, but certainly no findings that anyone would call diffuse interstitial lung fibrosis or even chronic diffuse infiltrative parenchyma lung disease of any kind that go, would go along with restrictive lung disease. So I presume that he has a uh, diminished vital capacity, diminished force vital capacity. Um, maybe someone was prompted to label him as having restrictive lung disease, but he doesn't have fibrosis. So in that situation, um, one should wonder what the diminished FEC really means. And here the important thing is if you, if, you have, if you have access to lung volumes like body plethysmography, and if you don't have typical findings of restrictive lung disease in relation to TLC and residual volume, and they're actually preserved, then you should be thinking of something else. And here, the diagnosis depends on, I think, looking at the bones. So if you look at the bones, you'll see on these axial images, if you look at the crossover tubo, and costotransverse transverse articulations, they are all absolutely fused, all of them. And of course, on the sagittal, he has findings typical of ankylosing spondylitis, rather severe. And in addition to that, I was wondering to what extent his intercostal muscles at least were atrophied, but I wasn't sure. There's certainly some atrophy of his paraspinal muscles to some extent. So I think undoubtedly he has a restrictive ventilatory impairment as a consequence of the ankylosing spondylitis and the severe ankylosis of his costotransverse and costovertebral articulations. So I think I have an explanation for, for his overall clinical presentation and it's not interstitial lung disease. And I, I usually try to remember to look at the bones, but in an ILD case, one could sometimes not, and then miss this kind of thing and go by it. So Howard, could, you, could you show us the PA chest radiograph? There? Yes. Hmm. Okay. I presume you guys buy the notion that um, a, a plausible and likely explanation is, in fact, the ankylosing spondylitis. Very much so. Yeah. Yes, I mean, ankylosing the, spondylitis the, sometimes can the, produce. The fusion pardon? of the ribs to the spine is in, in particular, too. Because even with like idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, you don't see that. You get the anterior longitudinal ligament. But... Well, yeah. Probably just gives him a very rigid chest. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Howard, can we scroll down and look at his diaphragm and see if that's hypertrophied here, ah. looking at all of this? Um, it's not hypertrophied, but it's not it's not thin, so it's probably doing a little extra work. Oh, I see. Wow. Maybe trying to. Yeah, it's not thin. I think these muscles are really fatty and portrayed. Yeah, is he, was he on steroids or anything or? Just no, I don't know enough detail to know that for sure. I don't think so. I think David's point's very good because it, the di given the atrophy or relative atrophy everywhere else, the diaphragm's pretty robust. Almost, I mean, look how thin his rectus sheath is and the, the latissimus and hair. Yeah, the diaphragm's probably working overtime. Maybe because the other muscles are. Yeah, those intercostals look really thick. Yeah. I refer to this as human Kobe beef. Famous <laughs> yeah. for drinking beer and taking massage. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, once in a while, um, you'll be able to diagnose the cause of the ventilatory impairment, I think, if you look out for the spine. Yeah, I think this is a dramatic piece of that. All Thanks. right, those are mine. All right, who's next? I can do mine quickly. All right. So let's see. Okay, so this is the case that a uh, gentleman from um, India, I have to, Nasser, I know it's Nasser Choi, I think, um, sent me this. And this is just a very fascinating 
congenital case of something. Um, I've seen it before just on the right. I should have included a comparison of just sewing on the right. But it's this fascinating case of these uh, basically uh, extension here, at least on the right, it's extensions of the AB group quite deep. It's not at the valve level. I have the MRI. The valve is fine. The valve is, uh, the tricuspid valve is fine. It, it's this severe narrowing that's almost bifurcating the atria into two chambers. But the other thing is you see the similar thing on the left. Um, and the fascinating thing in the way you know it's congenital is if you look and not something that's acquired is if you look at the PA outflow. So the PA outflow actually comes from this more proximal ventricle just distal to the tricuspid valve, which is right around here. Um, and, you know, he was asked, I, the one case I have of this involving the RV, I, we, we termed it or I termed it. A, uh, basically a double chamber RV, even though I usually think of a double chamber RV as having a muscular band, which divides the chambers into two. So you usually have a muscular band in the region of the outflow dividing the chamber. This is just some very strange, and you can see it's like here is, we know the conus should come from the anterior aspect of the RV. The conus should come out here, but the conus here in this patient comes from this more proximal portion of the RV and we have this large fatty band kind of dividing the RV and then we see on the same thing on the LV dividing the LV into two it's really wild I, I don't know what to call it but you know he was they were thinking it was something acquired and I, I don't think it I think it's pretty congenital um, quite fascinating and you can see that uh, the pericardium looks normal, but you wonder if there's invagination of the pericardium. I don't see any invagination of the pericardium. It's just the epicardial fat. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has seen something like this. Again, I have a good case of it on the right only, but not biventricular. Um, I, I showed it to several other people. Uh, there's yeah, a little, it was the same thing. We didn't. Things. Nobody had a better explanation other than just bilateral double chamber ventricles. And yeah. Mark Hammer found a had found one case report of of like dual double chamber. Actually, Charlie's here today, so I may show it to him later. Yeah, but, and this patient has a and I have the uh, MRI as well. I couldn't uh, get it over and anonymize it in time. There's a little ASD or PFO, whatever you want to call it, but the atria are quite large, which you can imagine would be the case, especially on the right, because of the uh, impaired or increased red atrial pressures on that side. And um, it's just a very interesting case, but I'll send that one over. This is a, okay, so this is a case of, I'll show um, a patient who had an outside echo or outside cath, which showed that there was some coronary vessel feeding into the pulmonary circulation, not the best view. Let's see if this is better. Um, so you can see here that there is a branch coming off here. So we have an RCA injection. There's a branch come off here. I mean, if you do, if you look at CAS enough, I mean, I enough for me is occasionally this is, you know, the only thing this is going to be is a sinoatrial nodal branch. And you can see it feeding here, connecting with something on the right and feeding into the right lung. And you can actually at some point see potentially a little blushing in the right. So um, I saw that and then they ordered a CT because I thought, I think they were concerned about a fistula. And this is, let's see if I can find a good phase where we can see this. And I'd be interested to know if, uh, it's, this is good enough. Maybe I can find another phase a little bit later, but if you look, what you can see here, so here's that RCA, this is, a, and here's that sinoatrial nodal branch. And you'll see the sinoatrial nodal branch is quite large. Again, unfortunately, we it's a little bit blurry. It loops around here, and we're kind of losing it on this phase. But on other, you can see it connecting here, and then it travels through the mediastinum and hooks up with the bronchial circulation, and then shoots into the right hilum in this patient that has these really exuberant bronchial collaterals for someone, not the worst I've seen, but pretty prominent. 
Um, and you can see his PA is big. He doesn't have a known diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, uh, but his PA is quite large. His LV also is not, doesn't look that good. He's got infarcts. Um, but we, so I think this is a case of a SA nodal to um, uh, bronchial just collateral that we see in pulmonary hypertension. So interestingly enough, the people here, before I got here, uh, on cardiac cath in their CTEF cases, their severe CTEF cases, they see these uh, SA nodal. And there's also another one coming from the, um, up here from the uh, internal mammary, also coursing through the mediastinum, feeding into the right hilum. But ba basically, they wrote a paper on their CTEF cases, their bad CTEF cases, and found that like 40 or 30 or 40 percent had uh, specifically SA nodal. Oh, here's another kind of view of another branch of that SA nodal. SA nodal to bronchial artery collaterals. Here's another portion of it coming through. Uh, and I'm wondering if anyone else has seen that before or has ever looked for it. This is the first time. I saw I've, a fellowship a long time ago uh, where we saw that um, exactly like yours. And I think uh, we dug around a little bit and found that it's a, there's, there's congenital or embryologic pathways that communicate between the coronary circulation and the bronchial arterial circulation and that can open up. And I can't remember if our patient was a, I think it was probably a pulmonary hypertension patient, but I don't think it was a CTEF patient. Yeah, this was not a CTEF. This is just a pulmonary hypertension. You can see this, you know, here's the SA nodal branch. It kind of meets into this big, you know, here it is coming across. Case, well, this was a long time ago. It was like one of the, uh, we just started doing some coronary CTs when I was a fellow. Yeah. And, and this guy doesn't have CTEF, and um, but we just recommended he have a pulmonary hypertension workup. But in the CTEF population, or which is a, a you know a cause of bad pulmonary hypertension, when they all get caths before their surgery, and some shockingly high number have this collateral pathway, um, which we've have studies on, but they're not gated. And we this is the first time I've seen one, um, and it wasn't a CTEF patient, but the uh, first time I've actually seen one. So it's just a, a cool thing I never knew existed before a few months ago, and I think the first one I actually have seen. Um, and this is a interesting case. So I, I uh, this was a heart transplant, and uh, I read this on call, and has this, you know, septal thickening, and honestly, I was on call. I, I didn't have to admit, I was just tearing through studies. Um, the heart looked fine. Uh, and actually, no, this was, sorry, this was pre-transplant. So this is pre-transplant. This is not the study I looked at. This was the study I looked at. Um, and he was post-transplant here. And he, that septal thickening had gotten worse. And I just said, oh, it's just some, it's just some edema or something. I, even though it doesn't really look like edema. I said, maybe there's some pneumonia on the right upper lobe, which there was. Uh, but there was this here. And um, let me let me go back. Well, why was the transplant done? What was the? Oh, you know for? what? I downloaded the wrong. I missed the wrong study. There was a study before. Sorry, there was a study before in uh, February of 2018. Uh, I read this case. I did read this case, which was um, I don't remember if this was post transplant or not. I read this as pulmonary edema. He then came back many months later, which was recently, and this was increased. And now, then I said, okay, I went back and said, well, what the heck was this transplant for? And of course, if I spent five minutes on the first study, I would have come up with a better diagnosis than just some edema. And as we'd all know that with the history of the cardiac transplant, that this was amyloid, you know, I said, this is probably amyloid. Um, and the patient went, underwent open lung biopsy or uh, uh, cryobiopsy which showed that this was amyloid. Mm -hmm. So, and the patient has a history of AL amyloidosis, which I guess is associated with pulmonary involvement. Um, but I don't know, it, it's a nice case of septal thickening, the kind of one of the patterns we see with amyloid. And, uh, I, but I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of these cases, I, and I, I have to ask you guys, I mean, most of the cases I see with parenchymal involvement, or airway involvement, we know is supposedly an isolated process, although that's debatable. Uh, but I usually don't see concurrent cardiac and pulmonary findings in most patients. It's, it's often 
Um, I see a lot more cardiac than pulmonary, but I haven't seen one with both, but this was amyloid. And AL it was amyloid. amyloid heart disease. It was known amyloid heart disease. Yes, yes. So he had a transplant. It was amyloid heart disease. Yeah. Well, at least that's what the transplant said. I didn't, mm -hmm. or what the uh, path said. And the last mm -hmm. one is just a cute thing. Um, I'll send. I mean, I think the most interesting thing are the uh, two things. Let's see. One I had not seen before. Uh, where this patient had a whoop, had undergone a um, uh, aortic root replacement um, and uh, aortic valve replacement, and you can see the anastomotic here. And there is quite a long time ago in degeneration of the graft, and not only that. So you, I have not seen button aneurysms this large before. So this guy has pretty massive. Um, aneurysms where they re the most the coronary arteries to the graft itself. You can see one here, one here. Uh, two of the bigger button aneurysms I've seen. And the other thing which is interesting is he has this, the reason they got the study was this thrombus in the valve here. And you can see this thrombus extending across the valve. And interestingly enough, if you, I'll send over some videos that show it, that the valve really um, does not open and close well because of that thrombus is literally straddling the uh, bioprosthetic valve, or uh, sorry, uh, prosthetic valve. And here you can see that it's not closing because this valve is literally sitting there like a little door jam. And so he had free AI across the valve because uh, of that of that thrombus. So just- uh, That's just, impressive. That's impressive. I, I'm not seeing. Yeah. I don't know. Have you seen button aneurysms that big? I, I've no. I, mean, I see. Makes you, wonder, makes you wonder how large the the native aorta was. You know, like how much of that is. You know, is it really that the that it's an aneurysm, or did they just leave a lot of redundant aortic tissue at the sinus? Or was there some underlying connective tissue? What was the? Is it a, did the patient have like an underlying connective tissue type thing that led to the aortic aneurysm? I, I I remember that when I looked at the study. You know. Yeah. Three months ago, I don't remember now if he had uh, a Marfan's and uh, process. Well, we look at other patients. I can look it up to to see. Um, it it I, my if I remember correctly, he did have a um, Marfan's. So it makes you wonder: is this, you know, because this is the native aortic tissue? Is that kind yeah. of degenerate over time? Similar to the other thing because of the cystic medial necrosis or what other other process is going on. My, one of my other attendees by me said that she thinks he did have Marfan's. Um, in that case, yeah, it may be that it is now pathologic, that it's yeah. gonna continue to dilate. Yeah, so they went in and replaced the whole thing again. So uh, I'll have to look at the path, but. Cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, thanks guys. All right, Travis, Dave. I can, I can I, go. Uh, hold. Just. I've got three quick ones that I'll show. I'm, this is one that we occasionally see at this severity, and I'm showing it now because we have explant. The patient underwent lung transplant. You see she has large pulmonary arteries, and she's just got a lot of busyness, upper lobes more than lower lobes. And sometimes when it gets to this stage, it's hard. You know, people will just say it's emphysema, but clearly in this case, this was her immediate pre-transplant study. You can see these lungs are just too busy and there is some emphysema, but some of these things actually have defined walls. And there are some more just little irregular stellate nodules in addition to her pulmonary hypertension. You can see it's, as we scroll down, you know, the, it's so severe there is involvement in the lower lobes, but you know maybe the tips of the right middle lobe and lingula like we talk about are, are you know, a little spared relative to everything else. I think what's interesting in this case too is that she's had pulmonary hypertension for so long that she actually has pulmonary artery atherosclero atherosclerotic calcification as a result of long-standing pulmonary hypertension. But this does turn out to be long-standing or burnt out Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And you can see in the comments on the path that it, they said it's irregular emphysema, panlobular emphysema, but the stellate scars are consistent with Langerhans, which 
no surprise, I don't think, on this. And it's nice because we rarely get path proof in these. But what's interesting is she's had this for 35 years. And at that time, she had was diagnosed what they thought was EGPA, or Sjurg Strauss syndrome. And then at some other time, then she carried, when she came to us, she carried a diagnosis of, of GPA, or, or granulomatosis with polyangiitis, based on some repeat lung biopsy that may have shown eosinophilus, and then some, some skin rash, too. But she never had airway involvement. She never had renal disease. So I can't really explain the extra pulmonary symptoms, but everything else certainly fits with longstanding Langerhans. She claims she only smoked one, 0.5 to one pack per day for decades, but you know, but it looks like it's, yeah. Your case nicely illustrates the point that I know we've talked about is that the, the, with the severe cystic lung disease, often the architecture, the vascular architecture is preserved. Now I know she has pH, but you see the airways and yep. the, company arteries are very well preserved, whereas if you get a severe emphysema, it's just kind of a, a void. Yeah. So that's a nice case. And it's a path proven one. Yeah, very nice. All right. And then these other two are fun because they're kind of related in a way. Let's see. Actually, let me start with the other one. Well, so this, this guy underwent this chest radiograph or went, underwent a chest radiograph around this time somewhere else. And this thing was noticed here and it prompted a CT. We'll zoom in on it. I think, and we actually don't have confirmation of this, but I think it's probably some sort of dental drill or some other you know, linear metallic thing. I know we've seen dental drill fragments that look kind of like this and it is in a posterior basal segmental artery. I don't know what else, what other kind of foreign body it would be, but they prompt, it prompted CT, and this was kind of ignored at that time. So this is one of those cases where sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And yes, these are out of order. There was an older radiograph outside that I don't have, but that was what prompted the CT. And you'll see that he has this cavitary nodule in the, in the right middle lobe that's abutting the, the fissure. And of course, looks certainly like an adenocarcinoma. And there's the aspirated foreign body, probably a drill bit. Uh, but, you know, that's interesting in its own. And, and I still don't exactly understand why they got this study, because this is one I saw a couple weeks ago. And this was pre-op the day before surgery. And this thing had gotten bigger. But what bothered me was that A, it was broadly abutting the fissure. And B, there were several new little subtle things along the pleural surface, including this, this, you know, yeah. that. So, you know, we talked, I talked to the surgeon and told him since those were all new, I and this was budding the, the, the fissure, I was really worried that he was going to have pleural seeding. And did they want to still do a, a, a resection of the tumor? I think they, you know, and that's why I wonder why they got this, because they proceeded to surgery and confirmed both that it was cancer and that there was pleural metastatic disease throughout the entirety of the right hemithorax, just small little nodules. So I think, you know, I always look for those, but especially when the primary tumor is abutting the fissure or the pleural surface, it's important to be attuned to that because clearly now he has M1A disease from pleural involvement. And you know, I think since they're hoping that they can get some sort of benefit from resection of this primary tumor, but I don't know, the jury may still be out on that. Wow, that's a good pickup. Those are small. So then this one, this is, this is, I need to make sure I get the time frame right on this. This is kind of interesting, not cancer, but you'll see how this is related. So this is a, a this is a guy who was admitted elsewhere, and this was all done elsewhere. And he was admitted to the hospital for this, and it looks like pneumonia, maybe aspiration. I don't know if there's some component of edema on top of it too with the effusion. But this was on you know, August of a couple of years ago. And I will direct your attention to the right-sided airways where the right-sided airways are fine, the, the, his central airways. So then his, that gets better, but he gets another CT a month and a half later because he's still having some symptoms. And you'll see now that the, the aspiration pneumonia or whatever it was has improved 
but there's this funny thing right in the middle of the bronchus. And I think it shows up best on the coronal right here. So does anybody want to take a guess of what that is? Uh, yeah, yeah. It looks like, uh, like, a, a, like a little wheel of like a Lego or something. <laughs> Yeah, it, that's what it kind of looks like, right? And then I'll show it to you on the sagittal and you'll see the shape of it. This, is, this isn't this is some laryngeal or a hearing aid um, device. No, and, and you can see it's got like a little circle within a circle. So if I show you, and this is this was actually, I don't have the, the path, but we were talking to the interventional pulmonologist. It's some sort of IV cap. So, I don't know what happened during his hospitalization, but the story is that he must have aspirated an IV cap during his hospitalization. You know, it kind of looks like that green one or that orange one there. You're seeing it on FOSS here. You can even see the little spokes on it. Mm -hmm. So, but it's interesting. So clearly he was aspirating, you know, caused the pneumonia in the first place. And then he had a repeat aspiration of something while he was in the hospital. So they took that out. So we can add that to our collection of Is there something about your patient population where they just aspirate weird things? <laughs> like, like, I mean, come on, man. I mean, we have occasional yeah, things, but like, I, I Yeah, impressed. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. All the CTAF goes to you. We get all the crazy aspirations, I guess. So, but all right, that's it for me. All right. Gotta, David, do you have any cases? Yes, I do. All right, let's see what you got. So a nice case of um, an azagus fissure up here, but you don't see don't see the vein in it. And um, here's what CT looks like. Uh, this is the CT is a couple years before, but it's the most recent CT. You can see there's a pneumothorax here, and um, Here's our nice azagus fissure without any azagus vein in it. So empty fissure. So turns out there's a reason. Um, and that is that this person had a lung transplant. And this here are the native lungs with cystic fibrosis. And the transplant um, donor had an azagus lobe. So they transplanted the lung, but they left the azagus vein that was in, in that transplanted lung uh, behind with the donor. So here's an empty azagus fissure because of somebody else's lung. Um, and the azagus vein was in the normal location. So empty azagus uh, fissure. Now here's another person who has an azagus lobe and a little elongated azagus vein. It's a small lobe. And here's the vein. This person then had a heart transplant. And let me show you a CT. Let me show you a pre-transplant CT. I think this is, I hope this is pre-transplant. Uh, here's pre-transplant. So here's a pre-transplant CT. And you can see that there is an azagus vein here uh, within that azagus lobe. And then this person, um, there was a lot of imaging at an outside hospital. And let me skip to the next imaging we have that shows a difference. Now we have an empty azagus fissure here. And the azagus vein has, uh, is now lying along the mediastinum in this location here. So here's our azagus vein. It's moved out of the fissure down here. We don't have any imaging to show it, but there was said to have been an episode before this person, uh, around the time of transplant, where this person had a pneumothorax. And so pneumothorax then allowed the uh, lung to withdraw from the azagus lobe. And then when the lung was reinflated, it uh, the upper part of the lung came in outside the azagus fissure and, um, or, or the vein escaped. Actually, the vein escaped when the lung collapsed. The vein was plastered against the mediastinum when the lung re-expanded, um, the azagus, uh, kept in its uh, its new location, which is where it should have been all along, except for this congenital screw up called azagus lobe. So two cases of empty azagus fissure, one related to uh, lung transplant, the other related to pneumothorax around the time of heart transplant. I think somebody showed one of these cases, one of these empty azagus fissures before in this conference. Yeah, years I ago. years ago that um, had a 
patient had a chest surgery and when they dropped the lung, it popped out. Yeah. Yeah. There was an AGR article on that several years ago that described it. But yeah, it just shows that it, it's actually an extra, it's an extra, the azagous vein in the so-called, in the azagous fissure is extra plural. And right. it's just an invagination of a plural. And, so, and sometimes even the fissure disappears, I think, in a, in a small number of patients because the whole pleura pops out. Okay. All right. And then here's a person who um, I was looking at this radiograph um, because this person was being followed up after a resection of a sarcoma from a lower extremity. Some in the popliteal fossa, there was a sarcoma. And so I was really worried about these lung nodules in this person. And um, so this person has had a CT scan. And uh, well, first of all, let's look at the lateral. Um, the lateral shows that there are, are very nicely, there are lots of skin lesions here, but the lungs look fine on the lateral view. If we go back to the PA view, we see that there are a lot of skin lesions up here. And it turns out that the resected tumor, the sarcoma, was a malignant nerve sheath tumor. And so this whole syndrome is, um, as you would expect, this is neurofibromatosis. And um, let me um, show you this CT scan that shows very nicely all of these skin lesions, just masses of them. And the lungs themselves are fine, so we don't have metastases to lungs here, um, <clears throat> but we've got a lot of skin lesions. And then I think this shows up nicely here on a, let's do a 3D. Um, you can see that, well, so I was able to do it before. Let's see, where's it gone? Is it yeah, slab of it. Show you the, all these skin lesions just bubbling on the surface of the lung. I'll try to try to make that work um, when I send it to you guys. Okay. So, yeah, um, yeah. neurofibromatosis and pseudo lung nodules here caused by overlying skin lesions. And the last uh, case I wanted to show, and it may be a little hard for me to get the sequence right here. This person um, has um, a CT scan early on here that shows nice pleural plaque with calcification from asbestos exposure. And on the right, you can see that there's probably a component of diffuse pleural thickening as well. When you start to get round atelectasis and lung bands, parenchymal bands like this, it's not plaque that does that, it's diffuse pleural thickening. So we've got these nice radial bands that go with a component of um, pleural thickening, not just pleural plaque. So that was then, and then, um, a couple of years later, this person developed a large right pleural effusion. So here it is um, on a MIPS, a very large right pleural effusion. This was worked up. There was no evidence of infection. <clears throat> there was no evidence of malignancy. This was drained. It was complicated by a, uh, an a, um, empyema that developed after the drainage. The initial labs had not shown any infection, but eventually there was infection, so it was a prolonged course. And then um, here, here we're looking at it again. So big pleural effusion and stuff like this. No infection identified and no malignancy identified. And let me see if I can bring up more, more imaging on this. And then later, um, that pleural process on the right has resolved. We're left with some, sorry, we are left with some it's got a will of its own here. I, it's because I haven't renewed my Osirix in about five years. It's getting angry. Okay, so we, we're left with some solid pleural thickening on the right, just a little bit of blending of the costophrenic angle. The left pleura had been pretty normal, and all at once now we have a left pleural effusion. So um, we're going from right pleural effusion with resolution ultimately to new left pleural effusion. So I believe, and again, there has been a negative workup for malignancy and infection. I believe that this is a benign asbestos pleurisy. Um, the one thing that's atypical for it is the size of the effusions. Usually they're pretty modest and these effusions are big. Um, and when these dry up, these leave behind the diffuse pleural thickening that you could attribute to asbestos exposure. So diffuse pleural thickening in asbestos exposure is usually follows episode asbestos pleurisy with pleural effusion. You can see we have quite a bit of thickening on the right. But the right, the right side was complicated, 
not just by the initial effusion, but by the subsequent empyema. So this is, I, I think, a larger than usual set of effusions here, but the migratory, either the recurrence on one side or showing up on one side and then a few months later or a couple years later on the other side is just great for asbestos pleurisy. I've seen a number of cases that were bilateral over time. So I don't have a better explanation. I don't, uh, you know, I think Jeff, you've commented before that we don't, we've not seen very many of these cases. It's said to be common to get benign asbestos pleurisy and pleural thickening, but in my experience, it's pretty unusual. I probably have less than 10 cases, but I've got, you know, hundreds or thousands of cases of pleural plaque, but to see yeah. uh, but this is I mean, is actually the because I mean, the, the, the assumption is that usually the pleural effusion precedes plaque by, you know, maybe a decade, but I guess- by plaque or thickening. Or, or yeah, the, by at least plaque, um, you know, so if you, I mean, typically if you have a patient with pleural plaque, has had remote asbestos exposure, and then they develop an effusion, you've got to exclude a malignancy because right. meso or met metastatic lung cancer or something, because right. typically the, the, the asbestos effusion is going to predate any plaque formation. But you know, based on radiographs, and my CT, I don't know, but yeah, that's an odd case. Yeah. Okay, those are my cases. Excellent. All righty, so I have a little trio of cases. So this first case is a patient who had a chest radiograph for, well, I got to share my screen. You guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Had a chest radiograph for some reason, cough or something. And uh, the right hilum was commented on the frontal view to be looking abnormal. And we don't, the normal angle we see there maybe is a little abnormal. I agree. And we have this funny looking opacity here. Here's the airway. So there's something out there in this funny structure. If we go to the lateral, oops, I don't want to do the CT yet. Uh, the lateral is a little bit more reassuring. You see the left uh, left pulmonary artery and then the right here. You don't see anything super dense in there, but uh, a CT was suggested and it's kind of a- It looks like it looks like there's like a, a second density over the pulmonary, the left PA on the lateral. Right in here? Yeah, because you see just above that looks like the left PA and then there's that extra yeah. thing right there. Well, what this turned out to be is kind of cool. So um, there's nothing at the hilum that looked like a mass. I'll show you that right there. But what caught my eye first is, um, you know, if you're looking, is you see this little tiny bronchus going to the apical segment of the right upper lobe. And we see that, but typically the, the rest of the upper lobe should be there and, and you'll see it's not. So here's bronchus intermedius. And you'll notice the relationship of the bronchus to the pulmonary artery. It's the same as it is on the left. And then we come down further, and here's the remainder of the upper lobe. you got the anterior and the posterior segments. And then just below that is the takeoff of the middle lobe and lower lobe bronchi. And then the next thing you'll see is there's no horizontal fissure. So then we'll go to the coronals. And what I think this is, correct me if you think otherwise, I think we have a case of left pulmonary isomerism with two hype arterial bronchi. And because of the, or the altered relationship, that's what's accounting for that hilar abnormality is this big vessel sitting on top of the bronchus here. And you don't have, you'll see there's no, you have two morphologic left lungs. There's no horizontal fissure. And, I look, and that other, makes sense Yeah, yeah. on that lateral. Because you essentially have two descending left pulmonary arteries. Right. I, I think it's a great option. That's really cool. Yeah, you got one and two. But it's weird that you still, it still looks like you have a right hilar vascular opacity as well. Is that like the pulmonary veins on that side? Or? I think what this is, is this is the pulmonary artery. It's just mirroring this one. Cause usually, you know, the right will branch right sort of intramediastinal and go up and down there. And this is actually the pulmonary artery coming across. If we go back to the CT, you see that big branch poking out right here. So I think you're catching some of that and it's, and it's lateral to the airway. So you, you, you get air on both sides of it and that's why you're seeing it. So Jeff, that, up, that upper bronchus on the right, how much of the right, right lung is it supplying? Just the apical segment of what would be the upper lobe. Cause I, I mean, that's a common thing to see the apical segment sort of come off separately, but there, I mean, where's the rest of it? It's just, it's just that one segment. If you go like follow the anterior segment, it comes off way down here off the distal bronchus intermedius, just above the origin of the middle lobe bronchus. And this is almost like 
uh, an apical posterior and anterior, and then the middle, what would be middle lobe is sort of analogous of the lingula. I mean, it looks like the lingula branch. It branches very similar where the, you know, you can see they almost share an orifice right here and right there, you've got the same thing. It shares an orifice right there and then just above it right there. Yeah, I, th I think that I think this is left lung isomerism, but with an accessory bronchus on the right to that. Correct. Apical yes, sort of. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. But see, this is sort of the lingula up a, the rest of the upper lobe in the lingula here. So it's yeah, so it's it's a replaced bronchus there. But it was just kind of cool because it's it's. It, when I looked at the radiograph, I was like, well, it's, it's abnormal. I thought it was going to be in some artifact or something because the lateral just to me there was nothing over the right hilar area. Yeah. Me. But you know, I, I, it's, a, it's just a kind of a, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. So this is a case that unfortunately I don't have a, a radiograph for, and this is just you know one of our favorite diagnoses in this conference. Um, and this patient actually underwent surgical repair uh, for this, but this is the old scan, and you can see we have a nice scimitar vein. As a matter of fact, we actually have two, and they join right right down here and go into the uh, inferior vena cava. We don't have any right pulmonary arteries, I mean pulmonary veins, so the entire right lung is draining. And um, the other findings, uh, I didn't see any systemic arterial supply, uh, but there is abnormal lobation of the right lung. So again, we have a single little bronchus supplying this small and a funny fissure here going to this upper lobe, bronchus intermedius, a middle lobe bronchus, and then we really don't have a superior segmental bronchus, more of just sort of a smaller right lower lobe there. So this is a scimitar, I'll show the coronal as well, um, just another example. And I'm st I still, of all the cases we've collected, I've yet to find any two that were identical. Yeah, and There's just so much variability in this diagnosis, but yeah, you can see the nice scimitar vein. And this one really has two, and they kind of come together right there. We had one other case in our collection that had two scimitar veins. And this one is the entire right lung. So she had a big enough shunt. She ended up getting a surgical repair of this. Did you ever see a systemic artery going to the right lung separately from the hernia? I looked at one. I did not see one in this particular case. Sometimes they can be small. And yeah, but if you follow the aorta and, and its branches, there's really nothing sneaking in there at this point. But yeah, and then the other thing you'd look for would be a diaphragmatic defect or you know, extra band of diaphragmatic tissue, which sometimes you'll get right along the scimitar vein, sort of right there. But that, I think that's just a fissure. But nice scimitar. So another congenital case. And then this third case, um, this is just, this is kind of a different case. This is something interesting. I, I don't think I showed this case, but we did the CT. This patient had a cardiac Sestamibi scan, and this was noted on it. On the raw images, there was this... Um, uptake in the upper chest. So uh, have a CT scan. This is the right one. And the only thing that correlates with that is a little bit of thymic tissue in that area. And so there are, I did do some digging, there are reports of maybe uptake in thymic cysts, thymomas, uh, you know, sort of uh, art of, uh, um, one case was a false positive for a parathyroid adenoma, it ended up being just thymic tissue. Um, and then somehow this one got merged into it. It's a different case, I think. So um, there's that one. And then I think this is the thing I wanted to show. Let's see, this is the separate case. Yes, so this is the yeah, this is another case. I don't know how I got emerged in there, but um uh, so this is another case. That that's that one. So I don't know if anybody else. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but something to be aware of. In a case, says to maybe uptake. This is the cool case. So this is another congenital case, and this is a patient. Uh, let me see if I can find the right one. Yeah. So this is the CT, uh, and you'll see there's pleural effusion on the left, and there is also this funny pericardial effusion. In this case, Chris gave me, and you see uh, it looks like they're in communication. There's the epicardial fat. So the pleural space is communicating all the way anteriorly here with what looks like the pericardium. And there's an older scan, which is this one, without pericardial or pleural effusion that shows a little divot here with lung in that area. And then the absence 
of the left aspect of the pericardium. You have a little bit down there, but you see there's missing pericardium here. And so in this case, there's communication between the left pleural space and uh, this area out there with that accumulated with fluid. Have you guys ever seen something like that before? Seen the droopy heart, but not the communication. So what was the cause of the pleural effusion? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh. It's just, yeah, I, I, so. She's got rheumatoid. Yeah, I think it's rheumatoid. Yeah. Yeah. rheumatoid. Um, yeah, it's just interesting how I was trying to figure, wrap my head around how, how this communicates, but I guess if, you know, the, the parietal pericardium and the parietal pleura along the heart are probably right. um, fuse or at yeah. least, uh, and so if it's just absent, the, 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 the pleura just insinuates itself in there. The, uh, but, you know, the way the heart is sort of uh, drooping off to the left like that is, gr is great for this absent, absent left pericardium yeah. Yeah. too. Um, and then you see that, yeah, and this, I forget what, so I think somebody's described this little sign or something, but this little no, tongue of knot that goes right. in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So, yeah, somehow that got fused in with my uh, thymic SS and maybe up to, I'll split it off before I send it to you guys. Okay, well, thank you. Those were great cases today. Thanks. See you next week. Thanks. Right, Thanks, guys. Bye. bye. Thanks, everyone.